Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We talk a lot on our program about where food comes from. Today we're going to put a twist on that idea. Every product on the shelf at the grocery store or in your pantry has been methodically researched. Taste, texture, not to mention the ingredients have been tested, refined, and then tested again. Here in Vermont, researchers from UVM Extension's Northwest Crops and Soil Program have been working with farmers and bakers to produce a product that's well suited to our climate. We're talking about rye. Rye bread makes for great sandwiches, and as researchers are learning, it might be the perfect crop to grow here in the Green Mountains. Here's Keith Silva. Winter rye has become ubiquitous in Vermont's landscape. Farmers use this cereal grain as a cover crop. It's planted in the fall, grows quick, and is winter hardy. It's the perfect crop to protect soil from erosion and nutrient runoff. And oh yeah, it's also food. In about a week and a half, this rye will be flowering and getting ready to produce grain. Heather Darby is a UVM Extension agronomist. For years, she's encouraged farmers to grow winter rye as a cover crop. We don't normally let the cover crop get this big um, in our uh, corn systems because right about now, we're usually getting ready to plant corn. So the cover crop um, is terminated either by tillage or now farmers plant right into this and manage it in different ways. This stand of winter rye is a test plot at the Board of View Research Farm in Alberg. It's being allowed to go to seed because winter rye has value beyond its benefits to the environment. We have, in some years, 30,000 acres of cereal rye planted for cover crop. What if we could take some of that um, and let it go to seed, harvest the seed, and start bringing it to bakers? It's a really great grain, a wonderful flavor. All kinds of great breads can be made with it. Randy George is the owner of Red Hen Baking Company in Middlesex. He's using rye grown and harvested at Boardview Research Farm to answer a simple question. How's it taste? If you're growing a tomato, usually if it looks good, it tastes good. You know, it's fun to play around with different varieties and taste, taste them, but it's rare to see a nice juicy red tomato that doesn't taste good. But there's a lot more going on with grain that is invisible. And so uh, it only becomes visible when uh, you do some lab tests and or you do some bake tests. I feel on there, Henry? Pretty good. On hand to help and observe the baking tests is Henry Blair. He works with Darby as a researcher for the UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils Program. Our region here is much wetter and cooler than most grain growing regions uh, in the U.S. and in the world, and those drier conditions are better for wheat and barley crops. But for rye, which tend to grow in cooler and wetter environments, uh, we think of in northern and eastern Europe, which are very similar to here in Vermont. It can handle more rainfall and more moisture during the growing season. That rainfall, which could be detrimental to a wheat crop, may not be as serious a problem for rye. Late season rain is not good for most grains. That's because rain or too much moisture too close to harvest causes sprouting or germination, which impacts quality. The quality of the grain, and therefore flour, is determined by what's called the falling number. Yeah, it's a pretty descriptive term. Uh, so we take a, a measurement of flour and water, make a slurry in a test tube, and it goes into a machine that measures the time and seconds it takes for a plunger to fall through the slurry to the bottom of the tube. And that time in seconds is the falling number value. And that value is something we understand very well for wheat and even for barley, but we understand less what it means for rye. And so that's what we're trying to figure out here. What falling number ranges still make a good quality rye loaf? The rule of thumb for bakers is to use flour that has a falling number over 250. The rye flour in this experiment ranges from 91 to 287. As bakers, uh, we might be okay with some sprouting in the field and consequently a lower falling number, which is usually like something bakers don't want to hear about. Um, so this is all in an effort to um, see what, what more we can do with rye in Vermont. 
George has been a longtime champion of using local ingredients. Across the Fence first met George in 2011 when he was working with local grain growers to produce a 100% made in Vermont bread. We need to be working together as farmers and bakers to uh, come up with something that, that is unique to Vermont. If you were standing here five years ago and you asked me, um, do you think there's ever going to be a time when you could make 100% Vermont, I, I would have given you a whole list of reasons why that's next to impossible. So it's really remarkable that, it, that, it's, that we're in this position. A decade on, George remains steadfast in his commitment to quality and taste in his products. He may want to use local grain, but he's not going to adjust his standards just because it's grown nearby. There's no point in having something that's disease resistant, yields great, but doesn't taste good. Um, so that's the fun thing about this is that we get to, we get to interact with the researchers and, and the researchers are excited to find out uh, how, how this stuff tastes. Out back of Red Hen's Bakery and Cafe, George and Blair tasted the results of their efforts. The rye flavor is great. Loving the taste, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it seem more moist to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, chewier too, yeah. Rye bread tends to be darker and denser than white or whole wheat bread. It's described as having an earthy taste. Rye bread is also gluten-free. The differences we're seeing with this versus the others have to do with the grain. Mm -hmm. not, the, not the baker. Yeah, yeah. It's up to the producer to decide if those are qualities that they want or don't want. And hopefully come up with a recommendation to farmers of, okay, this is, a, this is when you should try to harvest your crop. That's because right. Because this is the timing that correlates to the best quality end product. Yeah. This project proves the quality of the ingredients and the final product are ready for market. Now it's a matter of getting the market ready for rye. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done in um, infrastructure to turn the grain into a food product uh, that's demanded by consumers. So I think a farmer would really see any crop as a cash crop if it's marketable. Um, and right now that's where a lot of the challenge is, is understanding what the quality means for end products, creating those end products that are demanded by consumers. Yeah, so that end of the supply chain is, is still in development. As markets develop and demand grows, George takes pride in doing his part for both the science involved in the research and the art of baking. Working with researchers like Heather and her team, we're, we're actually perhaps having an influence on um, what ends up getting grown. And, and that's really exciting to think that, you know, someday we might be making a, a loaf of bread that everything from planting methods to, and dates to harvest, uh, harvest times was uh, determined in, in conjunction with, with the bakers. Randy is making excellent breads with it. And, um, you know, we're seeing those, those end products. So there's huge potential for this to fit into Vermont's landscape very well. Winter rye covers a lot of ground in Vermont. Its growth in the marketplace will depend on the hard work of researchers and producers. And there's nothing funny or rye about that. In Middlesex, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Thanks, Keith. Uh, and we wanted to add a postscript to this story by mentioning that King Arthur Flower in Norwich, Vermont, also participated in baking tests for this research on winter rye. So Heather Darby has joined me in the studio now. She is our soil maven. It's so great to have you with us. So it looks like rye has passed all the tests. What's next for the research project? Yeah, well, um, <clears throat> I think we're still looking at varieties, mm -hmm. number one. There are a growing number of different cereal rye varieties that are available because there's an increase um, in demand, both for cover crop seed, but also for food grade purposes. So we're trying to figure out what varieties grow best here, yield best, and have that quality and flavor that Randy and Henry were talking about. Okay. So. Yeah, that's one, one thing. So what about working with Vermont Stillers to find out if your rye is uh, growing, could be used in spirits? Yeah, so we, we have also been working with uh, different distilleries. And the first step in that process was sending some of our rye to Hartwick 
co college in New York. They mm. actually have a laboratory that looks at the distilling quality of grains. And so we sent all of our samples there to see which varieties again are gonna make um, the best distilled spirits. And now working with local distilleries to um, do some similar projects that we're doing with Red Hen Bakery. Awesome, and does the Vermont have the infrastructure such as mills to make the flour to support this increased uh, rye production? No, <laughs> so that is that, that's yeah, that's been an ongoing issue as we're trying to um, encourage cereal grain production or any grain production in Vermont. Um, it's not, you know, we don't we haven't traditionally grown a lot of grain here, not for a very long time. And so rebuilding that infrastructure, um, mills, handling systems, dryers, grain bins, um, a lot of pieces that we we don't have, but luckily, you know, the infrastructure exists um, just north of us really in, in Quebec. So, hmm. but you know, it's gotta be rebuilt. And in order to rebuild it, there has to be markets um, for the grain to go to. So, so it's kind of a chicken and the egg. <laughs> right, so so, yeah. so so the market, so so what has to happen for farmers and producers uh, to, to grow more, um, is it really a marketing issue of getting more people to want rye and rye bread, which is delicious? Yeah, I mean, any of the grains that are gonna be grown in Vermont, whether it's, you know, rye or wheat or barley, um, we're not gonna be selling them off to you know as a commodity because our scale is so much smaller than other places so the only reason really that makes sense for us uh to grow those grains economically you know to be a viable ag um, crop here in vermont is that they'd be used locally and add value to a local product which then would add value at the farm gate so you know making sure that um, local food products that are made here um, know that there's grain that can be grown and mm. used in their product and starting to make those connections, just like we've done with Randy and others, building okay. those relationships. Um, thank you so much, Heather, for joining us today and, and sharing the good news about uh, rye. Uh, to find out more about r the research being conducted by the UVM Extension Northwest Crops and Soils Program, visit the website listed on your screen. There you're going to find ongoing research and results about what the team has learned about grain and corn and hops and hemp. And you could probably also find out about the annual field days, which I think is being modified a little bit, but will happen in, uh, in July or August. That's our program for today. Thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. Stay well.